you have cancer, three words that change a life forever. We would like to offer another three words. Be an overcomer. Welcome to the 1% Podcast, where our conversations with other cancer warriors, survivors, and caregivers allows us to give you that extra boost you need to face your challenge head on, live life from a new perspective, and forge a path that keeps you moving free and clear. Now, welcome your host and cancer survivor, Truett Taylor. Welcome, everyone, to the 14th episode of the 1% Podcast, the show where we dig deep with cancer warriors, survivors, and caregivers in order to give you that 1% you need to keep pushing forward. Today on the show, we have Rachel. Rachel was diagnosed with stage 2B mammary carcinoma when she was 36 years old. Rachel is currently a registered nurse in Lincoln, Nebraska, and has three children. Rachel, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Absolutely. So Rachel and I... Met through Instagram. Um, I just happened to be scrolling through different stories of people. And Rachel's story really caught my eye because of some of the photos that she had posted and how transparent she was with her surgery, her all of her treatment. And I just thought, wow, this is definitely somebody I've got to talk to. And once we spoke, I just knew immediately that your story had to be told. And um, I said this to you before, but you know, I cannot wait for your story to impact all the listeners that we have on the podcast. So i um, super excited to, to be talking to you today and very enthusiastic for you to be able to share your story. So why don't you start off by telling all of our listeners today why you feel like it's important for you to be able to share your story? Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. It's it's an honor to be able to to share my story and um Basically, that's what I want to get across to everybody is just being able to um, embrace your journey um, with cancer, knowing that you are um, unique and you you have, you know, um, a uniqueness that needs to come out and your identity should not be the cancer and to kind of hold on to, to yourself through the journey and just, you know, embrace it. Yep. Cancer is part of your journey. It's not your entire exactly. existence for life. So what's one takeaway that you want everyone listening today to be able to take from this episode and apply to their life? Um, just knowing that, like I said, it is, it's going to be your journey. And just because you're reading blogs or you're listening to this podcast or you, you know, you know, somebody who knows somebody who's had the same type of cancer as you to, to know that it's going to be specific um, to you and um, not to think, okay, I should be feeling a certain way if you're not feeling a certain way, if that makes sense. And to kind of um, just dig down into your own heart, into your own mind and um, just run this race just with you. You're not competing with anybody else. And um, so don't try to identify with anyone, just find your own identity and, and go with it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Every there's a different recipe for everyone, and mm-hmm. because some treatment or some herb or something worked for somebody doesn't mean necessarily going to work for you. So educate exactly. yourself, just like Rachel said, and you know your body more than anyone else. So listen to your body and surround yourself with wonderful people, and then you will work your way through all this. So right, yeah, there's really no wrong or right way to fight cancer. Totally agree. Um, Yep. And so just do what you got to do. All right. So tell us a little bit about your life prior to your diagnosis. Right. So I, um, I am a registered nurse and I've been working in a outpatient setting as far as it's an urgent care. So it's not inpatient. And I do that part time and full time. I'm a mom of three. I have three kiddos, a seven-year-old daughter, a five-year-old daughter, and a three-year-old son. Um, I'm also a wife. I've been married for eight years, eight and a half years. And we recently moved to Lincoln, Nebraska a year ago. I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, though, so not too far from home. But uh, my family knows Knoxville, Tennessee as as their real home, so we're hoping to get back there in a couple years. So um, this is where I've been for the last year and working as a nurse. Very active, um, very healthy as far as eating. I love, never met a vegetable I didn't like. 
So um, it was very healthy, obviously with three small kids, I'm extremely active and um, I grew up as a dancer. So I am happiest when I am moving. So um, I had no, you wouldn't look at me and think, wow, she, she's probably going to get cancer. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's kind of my backstory there. Okay. What made you want to be a nurse? You know, when I was in high school, my grandfather, my, on my dad's side, his dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and going down that journey with him. And he had a hospice nurse during his last, you know, couple weeks and just the way that she was with him and with the family, she just honestly touched my heart. And I knew from that instant, I want to be able to, um, to work with, with anyone that is suffering and within families as well. So that kind of steered me down that path. I love that. That, that. Those are the type of people that need to be nurses. So yeah, it's definitely a calling for sure. Love it. All right. So life's going great. Everything's good. It sounds like it's good. Yeah. had a career going. <laughs> Everything's wonderful. Share with us today, like the moments leading up to the day where you were diagnosed. Yeah. So, and, um, it, it was just this year I was diagnosed. So, um, the second week of March or so I woke up one morning and had a swollen lymph node under my right arm and being a nurse, I immediately start thinking, what is, why, why do I have this? Where's it coming from? Uh, the week prior, my family had been passing around the flu. It was the end of the cold and flu season. So of course, you know, my youngest one gets it and then we all, <laughs> so I just, you know, chalked the, the large lymph node up to just being a reactive node from being sick. Didn't think much of it. Um, a week went by, it was still there. I went to work and the provider I was working with that day, I just mentioned it to her. I said, Hey, can you check this node out? Like, what do you think it is? You know, we'd all been sick. She agreed with me. It's just a reactive lymph node, nothing to think about. Of course, she went down the list of, do you have breast cancer any history of cancer? Have you had any of these other symptoms? And everything was no. I had no breast changes I could feel at the time. It was just the node. So she said, let's give it, you know, about four weeks and see what happens. So four weeks goes by and there's been no change to the lymph node. It's gotten a little bit bigger. And now I'm starting to feel something different in my breast. And not a defined, you know, everyone, I've, I've heard that pea size. Oh, I felt a pea size like lump or in my breast. It wasn't like that at all. Like it wasn't a, like the margins weren't normal kind of thing. So I still didn't, my mind didn't go to cancer just because I didn't have any of the history. I was perfectly healthy. Otherwise, like I said, I eat tons of vegetables. So I did never go there. But when I brought it up to her again, when I was at work and it had been four or five weeks since I found the lymph node, she said, let's go ahead and send you on to get some imaging done. You know, I was 36 years old. I'd never had a mammogram done. So she said, let's get some images done and just kind of see what's going on. So I ended up going and getting the imaging done and I had an ultrasound and a biopsy the same day. So I went to an appointment I thought was going to be an hour long and I ended up being there for three hours that had bilateral mammogram, um, biopsy, ultrasound, and another biopsy. So they biopsied two spots. So my three-hour appointment kind of, you know, made me think, this has got to be something else besides just a reactive node. And um, sure enough, it was. So I did get a call, um, you know, a couple of days later saying that they did find cancer in both my breast and in my lymph node. So what's going through your mind as you're, getting all these biopsies and you're getting, you're starting, I'm, I'm assuming get concerned a little bit and you're, I'm assuming you're telling your husband, like you guys are talking through all this, what's going through your mind as you're starting to go down this road of what if? Yeah, it's, it definitely, it was always in the back of my mind that it, that's what it could be. But after that appointment, so that my appointment was on a Friday that I just spoke of with all the, the diagnostic procedures that was on a Friday. And so they, when I left, they said, well, we won't have any results for two to three business days. Well, 
I've also got a Saturday and Sunday in there. So I knew I was looking, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, maybe hearing something on Tuesday. And I remember my husband and I that whole weekend, it just, it, it just, it wasn't a very happy thing. Like we weren't talking about it. We knew it was there. I had a feeling that it was going to be cancer, but my husband's the most positive person you've probably ever met in your whole life. And so he, of course, was still like, no, it's fine. It's fine. You know, and I don't know if he was doing that more so for me or for him, but um, we were just kind of, ugh, that weekend was a very long weekend. I was very overwhelmed and um, not very active with my kids. I'm usually very hands-on mom, but I was just so just, I felt this just cloud over me that whole weekend and those two days leading up. And then when they did call, I just, I kind of knew what that was. So they were just kind of reaffirming like what it is. And then my mind went straight to, okay, what do we do about it? Like, what is the next step? And I just went into action mode. So walk us through that day where you were sitting there and you got got the news and you heard those famous words that no one likes to hear that's been on this podcast. Um, walk us through that moment where you heard the words, you have cancer. You know, honestly, I think this is just being a mom in a, in a care, having a very caring personality. Um, I, I immediately thought, what am I going to tell my kids and what am I going to tell my parents? And my husband was actually on the phone call with me. He was here and we had the doctor on speakerphone. So they heard everything. And so I kind of looked at him and I was like, all right, like, what, what do I tell the kids? Like, what, what do we tell them? And at that point, we did not know the answer. Um, and then the next thing was, what do I tell my parents? Because being a parent, I have a lot more sympathy um, and empathy towards my parents more than I ever have. Um, and so those were my, that was my initial reaction. And, um, so I just started making phone calls. Like, this is all I know. You know, I'm sorry. I don't have any other explanation because they'll, they'll tell you um, if there's anyone out there who has breast cancer, um, you know, they make like a prognosis profile. So they, they find the tumor, they biopsy tumor, and then they try to figure out, okay, is this getting fed by estrogen? Is this progesterone? Is this? And so they make up this profile, which kind of is your prognosis. So the things that people are going to ask you when they tell you, when you tell them, okay, I have cancer, they're going to want to know what kind is it and what's the prognosis? Well, I didn't have either of those answers. So after I talked to my parents and um, my in-laws and my sister-in-law and my brother and you know, did the family, I told my husband, I said, I don't want to tell anyone else about this. Like, I just wanted to tell the immediate family because I didn't have the answers to the questions that were being asked. And it felt so overwhelming um, of just not knowing. Like, it was just the anxiety was building as people are asking these questions. And they're just doing it because they're concerned. And I still have people ask me questions I don't know the answer to. But I knew at that moment I was done talking to everyone until I had more things, more, you know, answers and the rest of the testing. But I did. um, And so after I made the initial phone calls, I kind of just shut down and I, I started journaling actually like the next day and I have an entry. It was like exactly 24 hours after. And it was, you know, looking back at that journal entry, I can just feel the terror and the anxiety coming off that page. Because being medically minded like I am, I knew that if it had moved to my lymph node, then that means that it had moved other places in my body. And the thought of like every time my heart was beeping or beating that the cancer could be like spreading somewhere else. And I mean, even thinking about it now, like I can just feel my heart racing because you just, there's so much unknown and, um, it was a really, really tough spot to be. That's really intense. I've never thought about it like that before. Every time your heart beats, like it's spreading. It was like, there's nothing you can do about it. And I just kept thinking, you know, okay, if I had like a normal sickness, like the flu, like I'd feel these body aches 
And I would think, okay, that's just the flu. It's going to go in a couple of days. But like with cancer, it's like you don't know what you can do at that moment. It's just, it just, it felt like it was growing and just consuming my entire body, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So I want to talk about the two moments where you told your parents and then when you, when you told your children as well. Okay, let's start off with the, the, where you actually spoke to your parents and told them that you had cancer. How did that conversation go? And what, you know, for all the people out there listening right now that get diagnosed with cancer, I'm thinking back to myself whenever I had to tell my parents, Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's, it's a very difficult situation, especially if you've had things happen to other brothers or sisters in the past. But um, tell us about your experience where you, you had to make that phone call to your parents and, and what did you say to them? Well, I had, I had told them that I was going in to have some testing done. Um, I don't remember exactly how much detail I told them as far as um, how long I had felt like the lymph node and, and everything. Um, so they, they knew that I'd had the testing done and they were just waiting, just like I was waiting for the results. Um, but... Sorry, it's kind of it's a little emotional. No, um, um, so calling them and then you know they were on, on speakerphone and I just remember telling them like it is cancer. I think that's all I said was I got you know the doctor called and it is cancer, and it was just silent, you know, for a while. I didn't know what to say. I don't think they knew what to say. Um, my dad automatically went into, okay, what can we do for you? How can we help you kind of thing? And, and my mom as well, just being, you know, we're going to do this kind of together. And my dad had previously retired the summer before. Uh, so it was, yeah, last summer, 2017. And so they had plans and now, you know, their daughter gets hit with, with breast cancer. And so it kind of put their life on hold and just thinking of being a parent now, like that's my kids are my number one priority. Um, you know, my family is, and then as they go on and have their own families, it kind of, you know, they find their own identity as not mom and dad, but then in that instant they went right back to, okay, like, how can I help you? How can what do we need to do? Like I'm their baby basically. <laughs> and, um, and so it was such a blessing that we were actually in Lincoln cause the summer before we were in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is 12 hours away from my family and they're in Kansas city. And this time, you know, they're only three hours away. So literally I could call them in the morning if I was having a bad day and, and just saying, you know, I, I just need you guys to come up and they would be like, all right, we're on our way. And so knowing that they had my back a hundred percent was great. But it, at the same time, I just felt so bad that I was kind of putting a, a hiccup in their retirement plans. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm blessed to have them for sure. Well, I think it says a lot about you that, your, their feelings took precedent over your sickness in a way as you were yeah, telling yeah. them. Right. And, you know, again, that says a lot about you. So an even harder question is, you know, how did you tell your children? So <laughs> my, like I said, I have, I have two girls that are seven and five. Um, I kind of, I kind of put that on my husband. Um, And we talked about it a lot. And we said, you know, like, what do you think we should tell the kids? When do you think we should tell the kids? And um, my oldest one is very um, type A personality. She's very analytical. She's very, like, logical. Like, that's just her brain thinks that way. And so I wasn't too concerned about how she was going to think because um, I knew how she was going to think it was going to be like, okay, so mommy's sick. Mommy's going to have to get medicine. Mommy's not going to feel well. And then mommy's going to get better. Like, I'm, that's just, that's just how she thinks. My five-year-old is five and she thinks like a five. She's very kind of off the wall, classic middle child, but she's very compassionate and her heart hurts when other people are hurting. And so I was more concerned with her. Um, 
And so my husband actually took my oldest one. They, they like to play golf together. That's their new thing. And so they, he took her golfing and, and they always have um, a Pepsi in the clubhouse after they're done with their driving range or whatever they do. And um, he told her actually over that. So I wasn't there for that conversation because I don't think I was as concerned if that makes sense about, I mean, I was concerned about her feelings, but I wasn't as concerned because I knew she would digest it better than everyone else. And my middle one, the night before I went into the hospital to get my port placed, I told her because um, I didn't want her to worry about it. And I knew I couldn't show up the next day at home with this, you know, thing. Like I just had a medical procedure. So obviously I'm going to look different. And I told her, I said, you know, mommy's got to go to the hospital tomorrow because I'm sick and I need a way for them to get the medicine in me. And she's, she didn't even second guess it. She says, that's just how it was. She was like, okay, that's fine. And then when I came home with my port, she looked at me like I had seven heads. Like it was, and I don't, I don't know how I expected her to feel, but she was so just didn't want anything to do with me. And I didn't, I didn't have any resentment towards, I mean, like I said, she's five, but I just remember thinking I didn't look like her mom anymore. And so that was a really hard place for me. Um, Whereas my seven year old who she was like helping me change the bandage and putting bandages on and everything. And my daughter, and still the whole time I had my port in, um, for all the months I had it in, she wouldn't ever hug me on that side because she didn't want to feel it. And so, like I said, luckily I'm not, I didn't take it personal, mm-hmm. but I remember it just being a really hard thing, um, with her. And then my three-year-old is a boy and he, all he thinks about are Hulk, Spider-Man, Batman, and dinosaurs. So he really wasn't too concerned about mommy, but he, and the one thing that we did tell all of them was that they could still hug me. Like mommy might not feel good. Mommy is sick. Um, but you can still hug her and the sickness she had, you can't catch because we didn't want them to think that it was like when they're have strep throat or when they have the flu and I like quarantine them in their room because I don't want anyone else to get it it was just a really important thing for me to let them know, like, this is not something that you can catch for me. And the more hugs you give me, the better I'm going to feel. Um, And that's just kind of how we took it with them. And then anytime they had a question moving forward, we just kind of hit it head on. You know, it's funny as you talk about having to tell your children in almost like three different ways. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like our friends and family in a way, because everybody responds completely different and they respond first with whatever is most comfortable to them. And then after that, they start, I guess, incorporating how you feel a little more when it comes down to how they respond to you. Yep. So after everyone, so everyone knows now, everyone knows that, you know, mommy's sick or right. you, know, you have cancer and stuff. Tell us about your treatment plan. What, what kind of medicine did they put you on? And then what were some of the side effects you started experiencing from them? Yeah, so I was diagnosed on April 17th. I had my port placed on April 23rd, and I received my first round of chemo on April 27th. So there was 10 days from diagnosis till I was sitting in the, in the chair getting my first treatment. And that was my first of eight treatments. So I went um, every other week. And for four treatments, I had the, um, the horrible adromycin cytoxin um, combination that you hear so much about. The adromycin is also called the red devil because it is like bright, it's like red Kool Aid, and it's the one that makes you really sick. So that you get the nausea and all that. Um, so I did that for four treatments, and then my last four treatments, I did ty, ty um, oh, I can't think of what it's called. Tax, oh, Taxol. That's what. It is. <laughs> so many medicines. So I did four rounds of Taxol, um, and the first treatment I remember 
thinking, is this how it's going to be the whole time? Because it really hit me. Um, the, the day before I had to take a bunch of steroids, the day, the days following I had to take steroids. So the steroids are making your body so you can't sleep. Um, you're taking anti-nausea medicine. You don't want to eat. Um, it just, your body just doesn't feel like your body. And at that moment, I thought there's 0% chance I can go through 16 weeks feeling like this. But luckily, I started feeling better after the first week before, you know, your body gets knocked down and then it gets starting feeling so much better just to get knocked down again and it gets feeling better and you get knocked down. And that's just how you go through your treatments. But luckily, my first one was my worst one. Everyone after that, I felt fine. I did. I had very minimal side effects. I started knowing more. Okay, days three, four, and five, I'm not going to feel very well. So we were blessed with having somebody um, give us money for nannies so I could have someone set up to watch my kids on the days I was going to feel bad so I could just rest. And I wasn't, um, it was in the summer, so all my kids were out of school. I didn't want to put them in anything and have to run them from here to there to there. And I actually was able to work. I worked my, my whole time that I was going through chemo, which some people think it was crazy for me to do. But for me, it was just normal. And the more normal I felt, the more I didn't feel sick. And so I kept um, going through, I worked 12 hour shifts and um, just loved being around my coworkers. I kind of helped me get through my days. And then after I finished my eighth round of chemo, I went and saw the surgeon and set up my um, double mastectomy. So I had that done the last week of August. So, um, and now I'm just waiting for radiation to start. So when your hair started falling out, how did your children react then? Um, it's really funny cause I told them it was going to happen and my oldest one, she, of course she was like, but it's fine, mommy, you know, it'll grow back. And my, I was really worried about my son because he's always has loved my hair. Like I would put my hair up in a ponytail or something. He said, no, mommy, I want your hair down long. So I was worried that he was not going to be okay with it. And my middle one actually, I told her, I said, mommy's hair is going to fall out. And she said, but you can still wear makeup, right? (laughs) All right. (laughs) I guess so. So of course they all had their own reaction. And when it did start falling out, um, I tried to keep it in until it just got to the point where it was itching so bad. And I just said, okay, that's it. Like we need to get, I need to shave it off. I can't take it anymore. My head was super tender. So we actually had a head shaving party and all my kiddos and my husband, we sat out back um, of our house with the clippers and made a little salon for me and we just shaved it all off. So we made it kind of a a celebration and my, my son was actually great. He didn't even care. He was too busy like kicking rocks and climbing in the trees to even realize what was going on. And, um, and I could still wear makeup. So my other daughter was fine with it too. That's funny. So you're going through treatment, you're starting to make your way through the side effects, the sickness, as you're going through all these, you know, breast cancer is one of those things where obviously it's very prevalent these days. And I know today is October the 2nd. So we're actually celebrating breast cancer month this month. So Mm -hmm. you see even more signs of awareness and and all those things. As you were going through your treatment, what kind of advice were you getting from, from people? Like maybe, you know, some good advice some bad advice. What kind of things were people saying to you as they saw you taking this journey? Um, People are going to give you advice. And my, my biggest advice for that is just really taking everything kind of, for what it is. A lot of people are going to give you advice just because it's going to make them, it makes them feel better. Like they're helping you by giving it. You don't always have, I mean, you have to listen to their advice, but you don't always have to take their advice if that makes sense. Um, I have, I have a very strong in my faith and I have a great church community and 
you know, their advice as far as, um, I think the, the best advice I got was that this wasn't a surprise to our loving father that, you know, God had me in the palm of his hand the entire time. And I, I knew that like in the, in growing up and in my faith and, and my husband and I, um, we had always, we talked about from the second I got diagnosed, like this wasn't a why God did this happen to me? This is okay. God, like, how are you going to make this matter? How are you going to glorify your kingdom through me? Like use me. And I, so the whole time I was very full of faith, but I never thought of it the way it was put as it wasn't a surprise to our loving father. Like he, he knew this was going to happen. He had everything set up as far as doctors, as far as where I'm at location wise now, who I was working, who I'm working for now, who, I mean, he had, nothing was a surprise to him. And so just knowing that I was in the palm of his hand and that I am in the palm of his hand this whole time has definitely been the best advice I got. And, um, bad advice, just people are going to tell you, um, a lot of times they say, I don't know why bad things happen to good people. And that always kind of bothered me because, um, nobody deserves cancer. Like it's awful. It really does suck. And, and nobody deserves it if you're good or bad. Um, I had one person tell me that since I had, um, like I was talking about the breast file, the profile, I was HER2 negative. And she told me that I was, um, well, I was a lucky, she said, well, oh, I'm so glad that you, you're so lucky you didn't have that. And I remember thinking like, I don't know if I would ever tell somebody who had cancer that they were lucky because they didn't have this other kind of cancer. <laughs> like, and so there were moments like that, that it was just, I don't know, not the best advice, but like I said, you just have to give, have to give grace to the people that um, are giving you the advice because a lot of times they don't know what to say. And so they're going to say something just to feel like that they did their part. Yeah. I want to go back to something you said earlier because there are people that, that are listening to this podcast. There'll be believers and non-believers that are listening to the show. And you said that some of the best advice you got was this wasn't a surprise to our loving father. And again, that makes sense for, for, for the, for the people who believe as we believe. And it doesn't for people who don't. Can you describe in more detail the the type of peace you get from knowing that and maybe in your best words, like how that peace really overwhelms any kind of anxiety or any, any, any of those really dark moments that you have as you're going through the worst times or as you're wondering why me or all the things that we all wonder when we're we didn't do anything particular that we can think of to give ourselves cancer. Can you describe right. to the listeners like what that really means to you to know that our loving father, it wasn't a surprise to him. Right. Um, I, like I said, I'm very strong in my face. I'm also very grounded in, in the truth of his word. Um, there's many times that let me think in the, in my, in the past where I've seen looking back, I've seen that he's gone before me. So there's, you know, um, knowing that he has gone before me and that he, he knew this was going to happen. And like I said, he, he set up everything perfect as far as the oncologist that I have actually has a great relationship with my husband and I think that it's more important sometimes for your support system to like your, your doctors. And me being a nurse, I know doctors. I know some of them are not good bedside manners. I know some of them are. And I don't care one way or the other from being just by being a nurse. But the fact that my husband got along with my oncologist and really felt safe with him and comfortable with him, I think was the best thing that could have happened for him. Um, like I said, with being in Kansas city, my family being in Kansas city and me being three hours away instead of being, you know, 12 hours away or more. Um, looking back, I know that that was God's work. 
um, my kids, the ages that they're at. Um, it's, it was, it's never a good time for you to have cancer. I don't want to say it was a good time, but they have been, when you talk about 1%, my kids have been my 1% more times than, than anything else. Just their, their innocence and them not knowing cancer as a bad thing because they, this is their first experience with it. And so when they think cancer, they don't think death. When they think cancer, they just think, okay, a sickness that you could get better. Um, when I, my hair was all falling out and I felt so ugly, I had no eyelashes, I had no eyebrows, I had no hair. I just felt awful about myself. Um, I went outside and it started to rain and my seven-year-old looked at me and said, mommy, doesn't that rain feel so good on your head? There's not many people who can feel that. And just like those moments where my kids were just the ones who picked me up. And so I know I, God put them in my life for this moment. Um, I could, I mean, I could go on and on and on like our church community, um, just everything that's kind of looking back, knowing that, no, cancer's not good. And, and that's the one thing too, I think that's hard about religion and with God, you think, you know, this good and this good God who isn't supposed to inflict suffering on his children, but that was never promised to us. Like we're going to have suffering in our lives, whether it's a divorce, whether it's cancer whether it's the death of a, a parent or a spouse or, or a child, like there's going to be suffering in your life, but he is never going to forsake you. He's always going to be there for you. He is always going to lift you up when you don't think you can go anymore. He's going to give you strength. He's going to place people around you to help lift you up. And um, yeah, he's just, he's so faithful and so good. And we just, clung to that. My husband, myself, my, my family, my kids, like we've all just felt so comfortable knowing that we are all in the palm of his hand. Rachel, I appreciate you taking us to church today because, uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I couldn't, I could not agree more. And that's, again, that's, that's why we're here. That's why we're talking right now, because these are moments that again, we, if you if you're not a believer and you're listening to this podcast, I just you know no one's going to convince you to do anything right now. But I just really want you to listen to, to to what Rachel's saying because you know whether you have a great relationship with God, a, a terrible one, or a distant one, or not one at all, like I think you can appreciate the fact that you know what Rachel's saying just gives her a tremendous amount of peace because you know again, you and I share the same values and the same religious beliefs and everything. And just knowing what you're saying, knowing that, you know, your children are a certain age, your parents are a certain, you know, distance away, the doctors that you had, that the way everything lined up mm -hmm. perfectly in such an imperfect moment mm -hmm. that was completely out of your control. And no matter what your religious beliefs are, you've got to acknowledge that that is very significant and very miraculous. Yes. And, you know, we're going to take it one step further and say, well, we know who, you know, we know who orchestrated all this. And then that faith that we have in God to, you know, to trust him in all his grace and his mercy through the most difficult times that we have gives us a tremendous amount of confidence that no matter what comes our way, you know, it's not just Rachel or it's not just true at dealing with this. It's, you know, Rachel with all of heaven behind her mm -hmm. fighting his head on and who's taken care of no matter how grim and how destructive it may be or and what's happening inside of us that you're not alone you know, when you're going through this over any kind of family and any kind of friendship when it's just you laying in your bed at night and there's nothing anyone else can do for you you know at those moments when we're praying and when we're really you know feeling the comfort of God as we go through these situations, those are the 1% moments that we have where it's just us and him. And that's when you get loaded back up when your emotional bank account is completely empty. He's, he's filling it back up 
yep. for you as you continue to fight and go through. And that kind of witness as, you know, when your family and friends, everyone's around you, when they see that, I think whether they're, they're believers or not, that definitely makes you stand out. And what I think is so amazing is you're able to pinpoint those moments and you're able to, you're able to recognize and be intentional about recognizing those moments. And you're able to take those in and share those with people, which, you know, you, you would think someone who's sick doesn't feel like doing anything for anybody else, but intentionally and unintentionally, you are doing a tremendous amount for people just by being who you are and just by being faithful like you are. And to me, just hearing you say all those things, I, I love it. I know exactly where you're coming from. And I hope everyone listening right now, you will, you'll take a mental note on, on what Rachel said, because she's so, it's so raw and authentic and emotional. And it's something that you should really take to heart. Really look like I challenge everyone right now to really look at your situation and look for those moments where things happen that were completely out of your control that were positive and moving you, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a doctor or your nurses, or whoever, or a note or a text or a call or a social media post, whatever it is to help move you forward through your journey. Because I guarantee you, if you look and you really try to be intentional, you will see, you know, how great God is and everything. And if you, if you don't believe in God, then you will be a little more curious and just like, wait a minute, there's, there's something going on here that I might not completely understand. And then you'll want to dig into that a little more. So mm -hmm. that goes directly into and past and everything else. My next question, when I was going to ask you, um, as far as pivotal moments during your battle, did you have any specific moments where you maybe you were at your lowest that, you know, again, certain things would happen? You know, you mentioned the moment where you're, with my daughter. Yeah, absolutely. Are there, are there other moments or anything that else you wanted to share that really stood out to you now that you look back? I know it was this year, but now that you look back to it, that mm -hmm. just kind of took you by surprise, but in a, in a positive way. Yeah, I've had a, I've had a lot of people reach out to me um, just saying, hey, I just went and got my, my first, you know, memory and, or, you know, getting just taking um, initiative into their own health, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I've had people who, I haven't been to the doctor in five years and I just went and saw, you know, my pri a primary care provider. Um, those things I really like. Being a nurse, it's so important. <laughs> so um, I love those kind of things. And just knowing that people are taking initiative in, into their own health. Um, and my kids too, I mean, just like you said, and like I said, being, um, they've just always been my 1%. And even the other night, my seven-year-old, she's, she's my very, she's the one that, um, is very wise. And I don't remember how she phrased, how she exactly said it, but it was something along the lines where she was telling me that cancer was good. And I was like, what do you mean cancer is good? Cause I mean, I've been very upfront with them being like, this is awful. Like there's no, like cancer is not a blessing. Yes. There's blessings that come out of it, that it's not fun ever. I've actually, I think I tried a couple of times to skip the country before some of my chemo things, but my husband wouldn't tell me where our passports were. So good for him. But um, my daughter told me that it was, it was a good thing. Um, she said, because now um, if it happens to me, mommy, I'm going to know how to handle it. And that was a huge other one for me was just like, you know, people are watching, my children are watching, like if anything, I could just give them a little bit of hope and a little bit of determination and just some, just a little bit of fight in them. Um, so that moment was really huge for me when she said that for sure. And you mentioned earlier that you've been keeping a journal ever since you started going through your journey. Mm -hmm. Is there any, you look back on your journal and you go back and read different entries that you posted. Is there anything in particular that stands out to you? Yeah, it's funny because in pre uh, preparation for talking to you, I, I keep, I went back and started reading early on and early on I was so um, worried about my identity 
being a cancer patient. I even wrote here, I said, I don't want my diagnosis to become my identity. Hi, my name is Rachel and I have stage blank breast cancer. That sentence currently terrifies me, mostly because I have yet to discover what the number is. That was before I knew if I was one, two, three, or four, or whatever. But um, what did I say? I don't want to be looked at like I'm sick and dying. I want to be looked at like I'm healthy and full of life. And so just kind of looking at that statement and reflecting on it and seeing where I'm at, um, I was – I. I think I did well with that. I think I, I was very, um, what's the word? Chemo brain always gets, I was very, um, adamant about not looking sick. I wanted to look healthy. I wanted to look happy. I wanted to do, um, I, I wanted to be sick with, and be full of grace, if that makes sense. So even though like my hair, I, I rarely wore stuff to cover my, my bald head because I just, I wanted it to be me. I want, I didn't want it to be, you know, me hiding it or trying to hide the cancer. I wanted it to just be Rachel. Like this is just how I am right now. Um, and then a couple entries more, I said the same thing. Like, I don't want this to be my identity. This is not who I am. I am not cancer. I am a child of God. Like, I kept writing these things over and over and just how important it was for me to, to just to be me. Um, I think if you have high blood pressure, you don't walk around and say, oh, this is my friend John. He's got high blood pressure. You know, and so I just, I didn't want people to look at me for the sickness. I wanted them to look at me for the goodness. Well, that makes sense. That. Don't um, look at me for the sickness, but look at me for the goodness. Yeah. So I was just constantly trying to find, I have a lot of entries, a lot of pages where I just says, count my blessings. And I just list, you know, blessings in, um, in big bold. I said, I love finding joy in the journey. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of fun to look back. Unfortunately, I haven't been as good about journaling Lately, because I'm kind of in between treatments as far as my surgery and then radiation to start, but um, it's been it's been fun looking back and and seeing kind of where I was and and how far I've come and um, yeah, it's been fun. So now, as you prepare to look forward to radiation and being the most tired you've ever been in your entire life, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, how has your life adjusted since you've went through the the surgery, the radiation, I'm sorry, the chemo, the surgery, and now as you go into radiation, how was your life, have you, I guess, how would you have adjusted to your new lifestyle? Yeah, I'm still, I still feel like I'm trying to find my new normal. Um, every day I wake up and I still have, uh, I still have pain from surgery. I'm, I'm about five weeks out and I still have soreness. Last night I couldn't sleep because I wasn't comfortable. So uh, I am definitely still adjusting. Um, but I feel like my family and we have adjusted well. Um, my husband and I are very good at, he knows when I'm having bad days and, and he, he picks up for that. We've never had a marriage where it's been 50-50. It's always been like, okay, let's just try to make 100%. So if you're working at 5%, I guess I'm going to work at 95% today. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of, and unfortunately, I've not been been helping too much um, with everything. But he, he knows, and going through chemo, my kids know now, okay, mommy needs to just rest. Um, so they adjusted extremely well for it. And... Um, I think I'm probably the only one that's still adjusting. And honestly, I think it's going to take me a while to really get to that new normal. Yeah. I'd love to circle back with you in the next couple of months and see, obviously your uh, double mastectomy is a huge surgery for, mm -hmm. you know, obviously for a female, but I would love to see, I mean, I don't know if you've, if you've got any thoughts so far. I've talked with several people who've had it done and it, some people just go on, you know, again, like anything else, just kind of keep, keep pushing through other people. It really affects their identity a little bit when you look right. down and it's, it's not the same. And what, you know, showed the world that you were a female, like it's not there. Right. And 
even in situations where, um, you know, marriages, you had to have serious conversations within your marriage about that as well, too. Yeah. You guys have had that kind of conversation or if you've experienced any of that, but if you have, I'd love for you to, to give some advice on, you know, being five weeks post-op, like you said, like what kind of thoughts and what kind of advice that you have for people out there who maybe have one coming up or just recently went through one as well. Yep. Um, my biggest advice is do, you know, do whatever you feels right for you. Don't make the decision for someone else. And I'm a huge people pleaser and I don't want to be a burden on people. And, um, I usually make decisions for other people, but when it comes to your body, that decision really has to be for you. And right before, right after I found out I was going to have to have a double mastectomy, um, God placed this woman in my life. Um, at a, we were at a pool like randomly and she sat down next to me. And of course I had no hair and she could see my port. And she said, I, um, I had that same haircut. And I looked at her and she just kind of laughed and she pointed at her scar where her port was. And she had eight years prior, she had had a mastectomy and she, there's a lot of different reconstructions available. And I didn't know that at the time. And so I just found out I had to get a double mastectomy and my oncologist starts telling me about all these other, all these re reconstructions as far as implants, or they can do like flap surgeries where they take different parts of your skin and your fat and they remake your boobs. And I mean, it's just like all these things. So my head was literally spinning. And then this lady came and sat down and she showed me, you know, she said that she opted for this kind of surgery and whatever. And I asked her, I said, so looking back, cause it was eight years, I said, what, what would you tell me? What would you have any advice as far as reconstruction? Um, at that point I hadn't even thought about what I was going to do. And she said, if it were me, I would do the same thing, but I, ha I would have waited at least a year or two. And that was like an aha moment for me because I thought that you went through chemo, you went through surgery, you went through radiation, you went through reconstruction, like boom, 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 boom. But with her, she said, I just wanted to just slow down and just be able to breathe. And that just made so much sense to me. And so I really thought about it and I talked to my husband about it. And so I'm just going to take some time to breathe and, you know, heal from this adjust to this. Um, and then down the road, if, you know, I decide I'm going to have the surgery done, then I'll have the surgery done, but I'm not going to set a time at the moment. And I did say something to my husband right after the surgery, because I, I'm just fatigued. I'm just fatigued from chemo. I'm fatigued from cancer. I'm fatigued from the surgery. And the thought of having another one ever again in my life just makes me even more fatigued. So I told him, I said, well, how would you feel if I didn't have any reconstruction? And he didn't say anything. And he was like, I need to think about it. And I was like, okay, like that's perfectly fine. And that moment I realized it wasn't just me grieving over the loss of my body, but you know, it's my husband, not that his, that my body is his, but it is such a change. It's such a, I mean, people freak out when their spouses get different haircuts. So mm -hmm. you think about that and then this is massive surgery. And so I still haven't got an answer from him, but I promise it'll be a good one and, uh, and we'll work through it, whatever it is. So just, you know, especially the, with a spouse, you have to give them some grace, whether it be, you know, the, the female making the decision about her body, give her grace. If it's a male, you know, if it's a husband out there and, and he's going to grieve over the loss of, you know, your body, even though it's your body, then you just need to give him some grace as well because it's, it's uncharted territory and we haven't been down it and you don't know how people are going to react. So, um, but yeah, my biggest advice is just do whatever feels right for you. I love that. You guys are going at this together. It's your, it's ultimately yeah. your choice, but your right. choice has repercussions to it as well. You know, when it comes right. down to your marriage, and right. I love the fact that you guys are both like, let's wait and see what happens. And we'll, we'll come back on this when the time yeah. is right and everybody can process it. So much has went on already. You're still kind of coping mm -hmm. with everything else. 
that's another huge decision to make in your life. And yeah, I have no doubt in my mind that you guys will make the right decision on that going forward. And, and you know, whether, whatever it is, whoever decides to to do whatever, I think you guys will be just fine together because, you know, you have, it's not like you guys have a great marriage and yeah, it's a healthy marriage. It's, it's unhealthy just to jump in stuff and you guys are yeah. really talking things out and stuff like that as well too, which is perfect. So, wow, Rachel, what a past 45 minutes that we've had just, just talking about everything. And what I think is amazing about this too, is because you know, I've had one conversation before this and for us to be able to have this, this type of conversation to, you know, we, when you have cancer, it's a club that you don't want to be in. Exactly. Before. Um, <laughs> I hate yeah, to say, I wish we never met. Friend I don't want to have, but <laughs> yeah, I hate to say, we wish we never met. But yeah, I'm really I know. Exactly. I have had a chance to talk today about everything, and you know, I really appreciate you being like just extremely transparent about what you're going through. And I know some moments are difficult to talk about than others, but your whole life is still being written, and mm -hmm. this is a significant part of it for sure. Just like you know, getting married and the birth of your children, but this is a deeply personal part of your life as well too. And I just want to challenge everybody out there that's listening today. If you're, if you're going through cancer, if you know someone that's going through cancer, you know, have a little grace on yourself and grace on the other person because everybody's at a different point. One day you may feel amazing, even though you're in the middle of treatment. Other days you may feel absolutely terrible. So, you know, really focus on, you know, that, what that person needs at that moment. And for you, if you are, if you were listening to this and you do have cancer, listen to yourself on what you need at that moment. If you need some quiet time where no one's around, then you need to make that happen. If you want a ton of support, you need to be able to have the confidence to say, Hey, listen, and especially I'm talking to a lot of the men out there. Like we, we hate asking for help. Most men do anyways. Um, you know, really reach out to whether it's your spouse or a support group, or honestly, like the reason I'm here as well too, is for you to reach out to me as well. All you have to do is log on to the website, 1percentpodcast.com or email me at info at 1percentpodcast.com and you'll have an instant support system. And that's, that's for anyone, you know, not just males, anyone that's, that's going through something, or if you, if you know of someone that needs to chat, I can connect you with someone like Rachel, if you have a similar experience. So anyone listening, just know that you have a community here through the podcast, through people that you've never met, that you've just listened to um, through your headphones, that you have a, a group and a community here of people, amazing people like Rachel that will be able to chat with you and talk about the situations that you have, just like the lady at the pool did with you when you, she noticed that you guys had the same haircut. So. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, again, Rachel, absolutely. Thank you for taking time and doing this today. Your message, your life, just the, your life so far and then the rest of your life. It's, it's so important. It's important in my life and it's important in lives and everyone's life that's listening. And, you know, I'm very thankful that you um, had the courage to come out and, and tell your story and to be a part of the 1% podcast. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for doing this. And, um, having an outlet for people to, to come to and to learn and to share. And that's what we need. We're all big one family that we don't want to have. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'd like to end each segment with five quick questions about you. Okay. Uh, so people get a chance to get to know you a little bit and know what makes you tick. So give us two things that, that motivate you each day. Um, my family for sure. My, my, my kids and my family and, and my faith. What are some supplements or products or maybe even with some websites that you recommend for people to try out as they're going through their journey? Um, let's see. I, I had, I had a lot, I don't know as far as like supplements so much. I basically took what my doctor told me to. And then I saw a nutritionist through the cancer center that I went to. They provided a free nutritionist. And so she helped me a lot with, um, you know, telling me, well, you should probably take vitamin D because that's going to be, you know, and kind of helping me along the way with that. So if anyone has that, it, it, you know, is going through cancer, if you have a nutritionist that you can speak with, I think that was really beneficial to me. 
What's the last book that you've read? Well, I usually read two books at a time. I usually read one for fun and then I usually read like a motivational um, book or something. So I'm, I read one that's called um, Big Little Lies, which is like a series on HBO, but I read the book. So that was fun. It's like a murder mystery. And then I'm um, reading a book called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies You've Been Told or something like, I think that's what it's called. So that one's been good too. So I know you're originally from the South. So what kind of foods or recipes that did you have that you want to share with everyone from, from where you're living right now? Um, I love, I love vegetables. I love like fried okra. So that's not really a vegetable, I guess, if you fry it, but, um, and I love anything Southern. So if you get, you know, the, the mac and cheese, but yes, be baked mac and cheese, not the kind on the stove. So just the more cheese, the better for sure. So those are probably my two favorite. I was always told if your macaroni only has one kind of cheese in it, it's not real macaroni. It's not real macaroni. No, absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) And what are three items that you have on your bucket or life list that you want to accomplish going forward? Oh, um, let's see. Um, My husband and I lived in Hawaii for about a year before we got married and we've always wanted to take our kids back. So I think it would be fun to do a family trip to Hawaii so they can see the island. Um, my sister-in-law and I went to go to China. I think that would be a fun one. And my husband loves golf, and I would love to take him to the Masters or go to the Masters with him. And so those are probably my top three. All right. So I always put this call of action out on each podcast. If anyone listening to the podcast can make any of these three things happen for Rachel and her family, please reach out <laughs> to me directly and let me know. And I'll be glad to connect you with Rachel. Thank <laughs> nice. you. Nice, wouldn't yeah, it? <laughs> it would. <laughs> All right. Well, again, Rachel, I appreciate you taking time today. I love your story. I, I, I loved our conversation today. And for all the listeners out there, Again, if you need to reach out to me, um, feel free to do that at 1percentpodcast.com. Um, be sure to check out all of our social media pages as well, too, and subscribe to us on iTunes. So, Rachel, you guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of this month and celebrate your life and, and all the people around you. And as you continue to go through radiation, we'll be praying that everything goes amazing for you. And I'll definitely give everyone an update on you in the next couple of months. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks again for having me. We appreciate you spending time with us on today's episode and encourage you to continue the conversation to help you keep pushing forward for more resources based on today's episode, as well as ways to recommend a guest and connect to Truett personally, head over to 1% podcast.com. Be sure to join us next time for more stories of inspiration right here with Truett Taylor on the 1% podcast.